Well, as we get closer and closer to the end of 2022, I feel we just had a blast what took place in pro wrestling. Some excitement, some surprises. But it doesn't end there. You know why? Because we still got our long, a little bit long way to go to the end of the year. So today we're going to be reviewing Stardom's recent event that took place in the, on the 10th of December in Osaka, Japan. As you know, Stardom began with year-end tour. This is only day one. We're getting closer and closer to December 29th for Dreams Queensum in Rio Goku, where we're going to have some amazing matches taking place. But <coughs> in this specific time, it's all preview matches. And also for the first time ever, even though this is a... a YouTube channel for pro wrestling. As you know, Promotion Gleet decided to have an MMA show called Gleet MMA Version Zero. Now, I'm going to give my thoughts about this and every match that they had. I know several wrestlers who are involved in the promotion also decided to get involved in the matches, in the MMA matches as well. So we'll see how that goes. And of course, we cannot forget we are in the finals of... New Japan Pro Wrestling for both um, uh, Super Junior Tag League and World Tag League. Who will walk out as the winners from both of them? Well, I'm excited to hear that. But also, we cannot forget the, the interesting surprise that will be coming from Minoru Suzuki. I don't know what exactly he's trying to do. I know many fans have speculated that there's going to be a new member or so. But we'll find out. And also, we're going to end it with... AEW Dynamite with Winter is Coming. We have Winner Takes All. Ricky Starks challenges for the Diamond Ring and, of course, the AEW World Title from MJF. I'm excited for that. And also, we've got some news updates to tell what's been going on in the world of pro wrestling. So, let's get ready for another episode of Deleted Wrestle Zone. Welcome everybody to Deleted Wrestle Zone. All things that is pro wrestling with AEW, NXT, New Japan Pro Wrestling, Impact Wrestling, the National Wrestling Alliance, various promotions, wrestlers, matches, and championships. I am your host, Jay Rod here. So let's begin with Stardom. This is one of the recent events that took place this past weekend on the 10th of December in Osaka. This is the year end tour 2022. Now, as you know, we're getting closer and closer to the end of 2022, and we cannot wait to start 2023. But however, let's get started with this particular event. Opening match, we have Tomoka Inaba of God's Eye taking on Queen's Quest, Lady C. Now, this was a very interesting match. Now, keep in mind, Lady C is tall as hell, like maybe 5'8", five foot, foot five foot 7", five foot eight, and Tomoka Inaba is really short. But that does not stop her due to the fact that she is... Uh, an interesting martial artist in every way, but it took the one shot, one kill, Tomoka kick to put her away to give her that W. Next match, I have to say this is a very interesting one. We have Edo Tai, consistent of Saki Kashima and Momo Wananabe to take on Cosmic Angels, or as they dub in this particular one, the Bad Babies, consistent of Waka Sukiyama and Atsupoi. Now, this is the first time that Poi and Waka have ever teamed up. Now, if you guys remember, or remember, it's been since July since Natsupoi won. Someone commented this on Twitter uh, during that time, since after she left the EDM, that Natsupoi should team up with Waka due to the fact that, you know, Waka and Boy are about the same equal height. Now, the only difference between them, uh, Boy is only 27 years old. She's been wrestling since 2000. And 15, so she has a lot of experience. And as for Waka, well, we know she's older than 
then boy, uh, she's in her 30s. She's 30 years old, but she's been wrestling for almost two years. But I'm sure she will teach her. Even um, boy actually mentioned on Twitter that uh, she wants Waka to learn a few things to true to use her size as a weapon. I have to say, great advice. And I have to say it was a very interesting uh, team up. Not to mention because they call themselves the Bad Babies. Uh, <laughs> there was a moment where they had uh, Momo in a submission move. Boy was biting um, uh, Mo Momo's foot while Waka was biting <coughs> Momo's head off. <laughs> I thought it was funny. But, however, it was um, the uh, My Emblem by Kashima to Waka that allowed them to win. I'm sure that Waka will learn a few things from Boy while she's with, uh, if they team up again. I think, but uh, having their tag name Bad Babies, not bad. I give Boy credit for that. Now, our next match, we have another tag team match. We have more of Oedo Tai, Ruka, and uh, Tsukotora taking on stars, Momokogo and Koguma. Now, we know that um, Ruka and uh, Tsukotora are amongst the one of the heavy favorites that could have won tagging. And I think that <coughs> this is a warm-up to show the world why they deserve the tag team titles. And I think that tells it all. I mean, they're not afraid to go aggressiveness. But it was the Ruka bomb onto Momokogo. That allowed for Oda to tie the pickup win. So we'll see what happens when we get to December 29th. Next up, we have Starlight Kid along versus Tekla. Now, this is the first time I think they ever faced off one on one. But the real question is who is the most sadistic and craziest of the two? I have to say that sh that's always been the case. But not to mention, Tekla is just like Julia, she doesn't like people wearing masks. But it did not stop her from trying to do that. But it took the O'Connor, um, the O'Connor bridge, a move that Tekla used. Starlight used it against her, and I think that was a pretty good one. But you can tell there was going to be a lot of fun between them. But of course, during the post my comment, I did like what uh, Starlight Kid mentioned. She said that she that she's like the little sister to uh, Julia. I mean, it would make sense. So we'll we'll see about that. Now our next match, this was a very interesting one. We have Masakurai taking on uh, Tam Nakano, but this is the interesting part. Masakurai seems obsessed to try to surpass Tam Nakano because she felt that ever since leaving Cosmic Angels and, and joining DDM has been a better choice for her. But the obvious question does remain: Will she try to? A surpassed her. Well, I don't know exactly what kind of game was Sakurai playing. She was wearing that one red gear. If you guys remember that same red gear that she used on the day she betrayed um, Cosmic Angels. I don't know if she was trying to get that over her, try to get in her head. But you know there's some frictions between the two because, you know, that's always been the case. But uh, Sakurai did show a lot of promising that she has, has changed. But... It was Tam Nakano with the Northern Cross. And a move that normally we see her try the Violet Screwdriver or the Tiger Suplex. But this time she used a submission move forcing Sakurai to tap out. But however, this is what happened in the end. Um, she goes out saying that she has changed and all this other stuff. That, But Tam said don't talk stuff like that until she beats Tam. You see, on general consistency, when it comes to matches like these, normally we see the winners of the match give out a promo, but the losing team, we don't see them give out a promo that much when they lose. But she feels that she can change. But I do remember uh, during uh, when when Tam won, she's self-aware that Sakurai has is getting stronger and stronger, but the more she's evolving to be stronger, so is Tam. We know that Tam is going to be stronger, and we know that she hasn't given up on the Red Belt just yet. So we'll just wait and see about that. But uh, sooner or later, they will come across each other again. So I, I, I don't think it's more... I think it's more like Tam's like, you can challenge me all you want, but you will not beat me. So I think that's one of the consistencies we're going to see. This is, I think, the third time they face each other. The first time was this year in... January or February, one of the two. This is prior before she betrayed them. Second time was during um, the five-star Grand Prix. It did not work out for her at all. 
Now, our next match, we have a trios action. We have stars consistent of Saya Ida, Azuki, and Mayu Iwatani taking on Queen's Quest, Utami Hayashida, Uzumi, and Saya Kamitani. A good match, I have to say, very interesting. Of course, seeing the strength of Saya Ida has always been impressive. But when it comes to the icon, you know how she is, you know, trying to um, show that she is still the icon. But in this case, it was a diving foot stomp by Azumi to Sayaida that sealed the deal for Queen's Quest <coughs> to pick up the win. Now, our main event, another trios match. We have DDM consistent of Himika, Micah, and Julia taking on God's Eye, Mirai, Amisori, and Sudi. Now, keep in mind, this is a preview before we get to Ryugoku. Julia issued the challenge for the red belt against Sudi. And I think that shows up. But you, sh you saw now in this particular match where Julia is being serious, that she is more determined than ever to, re to claim a belt that she deserves. And that belt is the red belt. And, of course, she put um, Ami Sodi in the glamorous driver and putting her away, giving DDM the win. But she did tell Sudi that she's going to destroy the Vermilion world that she created. Believing that she will end it and put a new world on top of that. So we'll see what happens at Real Goku when we get there. Uh, I yet to wait to see when they upload the following day uh, on December 11th. But right now let's just move on to Gleet MMA version 0. Okay, now normally I don't do this type of thing when it comes to other type of sports stuff. Um, as you know, I've been following the promotion Glee. Now recently Glee, this Japanese promotion, has been involved now with U U UWF rules. Kind of like a little bit of a mixture of the MMA style, like grappling all, and all this other stuff. But while back they announced for the first ever... Gleet MMA. Now, I made this channel more about pro wrestling, but as a fan, I decided, you know what? I'm a little curious about this. I'm going to see how interesting is this particular MMA. So, they called it Gleet MMA version 0. Now, some of you are saying, uh, J-Rod, when they called it version 1, true. I agree. But this is their promotion. They make the rules. They come up with decisions. This is how they did it when they first started the first Glee, G Pro Wrestling Zero, and then Glee Version Zero, and that sort of thing. So, um, some matches are MMA. Some are kickboxing. Others were grappling, you, that sort of thing. Uh, some of the match, the matches up to went to three minutes or five, three or five minutes, three or five rounds, that sort of thing. Um, so this is what they had. Our first match was an MMA. Uh, it's, uh, Nabuya Hasegawa taking on Toru Saku uh, Sakuraba. Um, this match ended after the first round, um, like right in the first round with a, uh, somewhat of a triangle choke submission. That kind of, it was a pretty good submission, not to lie. So this one went really quick, like real fast. Next match is, of course, um, kickboxing. Now, if you guys know kickboxing, it's kind of like boxing, but instead you're using your feet as well. Uh, we have Sh Shuya Arimura versus Soma Wananabe, who I've seen at the pro at the wrestling shows with Gleet. Um, I think this is his first time being there. But, however, um, I would have thought in my mind either Soma was going to get knocked out either in the first or second round. But no, it, it went all the way to the third round. And of course, it was decided uh, unanimously by the judges that it became clear that it was um, Shuya Arimura who won the match. So it was a unanimous decision by the judges. Uh, next one is another kickboxing one. This is now the ladies. Uh, we have Minero Kikuchi. Um, some people say she's already involved in this. And this, she takes on Miya Fukuda, who's a regular in Gleet as part of the UFW 
UWF rules. Um, this match ended, uh, went all the way to the three rounds completely. I was completely surprised because if you guys noticed or not, Mia Fukuda, she is an expert in karate. That's the reason she entered Glee in the first place. Uh, she did pick up her first win against Mochi Miyagi in a UWF rules. So I would have thought maybe she could either pick up a good pace. But however, the round and the match in it in three rounds with unanimous decision to uh, Ki, uh, <coughs> Kikuchi winning the match. Uh, a big disappointing loss for, for Kuda, but we know she'll grow um, especially somewhere. Uh, next one. Grappling. Now, if you guys ever been in, never seen grappling wrestling, you know that's going to be interesting. So we have Daisuke Nakamura taking on Yu Izuka, another regular of the Glee, uh, mostly involved in uh, pro wrestling. I thought this match was pretty um, insane, but uh, this one ended completely. This one only has one round. Um, I forgot how many minutes to go to, but ended with a silencer. Uh, it's the part where. They grab you by the head, like your arms, and wrap you right here. Try to shut you down. That's how it ended. It was done by Nakamura. He won this particular match by submission. Now, our next one is another grappling match. This one is a. This is between Hideki Shrek Sakini taking on Dan Tamara, who is a wrestler from All Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, I thought this match was pretty good. It went all the way st throughout the round. Uh, however, no um, no one submitted or anything, but it was decided by the judges unanimously that um, Sakane was the one who won the match. So Dan Tamara, I have to say, he did a pretty good job, but it didn't go well. Now, we were supposed to have a match after this one, but it was canceled. Um, don't know why. We were supposed to have Hikaru Sato taking on Taisei. Uh, so that match was completely canceled completely. Now, um... Our next match, which is the semi-final, um, we had um, Takuya Wade taking on Minoru T Tanaka, who's a pro wrestler for both Leet and um, All Japan Pro Wrestling. This match only ended, it was in the first round, but it ended quickly when the ref's decision, when uh, Wade, Wade uh, w uh, Wada actually was knocking him out completely. Um, Tanaka was completely defenseless, ended with that round, so... Um, Takuya Wada, Wada won the first, this match. Now, our main event, we have Yuki Kondo uh, taking on Tetsuya Izushi, the leader of 60 Seconds, also involved with Glee. Um, I thought, as a fan, that this match was going to end quickly. But, uh, no, it kind of went all the way to the all three rounds in five minutes. Um, Iz Izushi actually picked uh, Zuki really stayed with the match no matter what he seems like there was a moment he had the momentum but it did not but um this match ended all the way to the third round but the ref uh the judges uh made a unanimous decision that kondo was going to win this one so he won now let me give you my thoughts what do i think about the glee mma version zero i have to say it was interesting but it wasn't that much of exciting like i would have hoped but um, I'm willing to give it a chance no matter what it, until the next Glee MMA show comes up. I'll give you guys my other opinion what I think. But uh, just a friendly reminder, we do have a, a G Pro Wrestling show coming up on the 18th of this month. And then, of course, there's the Glee version 4 that will take place later on on the 30th of December. So those are two big events coming up right now from Glee. And I think that's pretty much it right now with this, uh, let's move on with, I believe, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Okay, New Japan Pro Wrestling. This is the finals of, of course, we had a double main event. Involving both the Super Junior Tag League and World Tag League. But there are other matches that we definitely want to talk about. Certain interesting ones that we can get behind on. Now, let's go from the beginning. Uh, we have Rohi Oiwa teaming up with Kosa Fujita. Taking on Sauce Heart, 
um, Elinda Man and Alex Zane. Um, of course, no one would have thought that these two would actually uh, be co um, cohesiveness during tag uh, junior tag league, but it, they pretty uh, did pretty well. But of course, like always, uh, Elinda Man ends the match with a German suplex onto Vegeta, and it was over right from there. Next up, we have Kushida and Kevin Knight taking on TMDK, Shane Haste, and Mikey Nichols. Pretty good match. It seems like the momentum could have fallen into Kushida and Knight, but however, um, TMDK were well prepared what they were what they were about to see. But it was the Tank Buster, <coughs> but um, that finished off Knight, and it was Haste to um, no um, Nick Haste who picked up the win, giving. TMDK the victory. Next up, we got a eight man tag match. We have Gabriel Kidd, Alex Coughlin. They team up with um, Flying Tigers, um, Tiger Mask, and Robbie Eagles to take on United Empire's Great Khan, Aaron Hinare, Francesco Rica, and TJP. Um, this match was pretty good, but however, you know that the Alex Coughlin would always surprise us with his strength, you know. Try to take out guys like Hinare and Great Okan. But unfortunately, TJP was the one who picked up the win when he pinned uh, Black Tiger. As you know, cocky that he is, he he actually pinned him. However, at the post-match, um, it was told that Flying Tigers will be taking a somewhat from a break. Um, of course, Rob Eagles wants to focus a little bit about uh, with himself as a singles competitor. So we'll see what happens then. Next match. This is the much interesting one. We have all members of the House of Torture. Uh, Dick Togo, Sho, Yujiro, Takahashi, and Evil taking on Suzuki Goons. Um, Lance Archer, Doiki, Yoshinobu Kanemaru, <coughs> and Minoru Suzuki. Now, you know this match is going to be crazy in every aspect how it's going to turn. Because we know how... House of Torture operates. They like to break the rules. They don't care about it. They would hide. They would. They would win at any cost. But one thing I did like what Kevin Kelly said: these guys are supposed to be members of the Bullet Club. How come they were the ones at the bottom of the pile in both leagues? And it's true. So the obvious question is: Will JY take responsibility, saying, "I'm sorry, guys. I wasn't there for you guys when you needed," or will he cut them off? I don't know. But there is a compelling argument. But, however, Dick was the one who ended up on the wrong side of the infamous Gotch-style Padra by Suzuki. And, one, two, three, good night. But, however, we've been anticipated what Minoru Suzuki um, was going to say. Um, I Luckily, I actually found that, what he was, um, found something regarding about that, um, about what he said uh, during, even meant to find it, oh, that's not it, I think I saw it somewhere because I, I, Here it is. Okay, this is what he said. What Minoru Suzuki said. In 2011, myself, Taichi, and Takamichinuku started Suzuki Goon. Lance Archer soon followed, and we ran wild. It's been 11 years since of highs and lows. Taichi, you really did use to be good for nothing. And look at you now. The experience, knowledge you gain has become so important to all of us. Lance, I first met you at an indie in Shinkiba first ring. You first time in Japan and I was the first Japanese guy you ever faced. Now and forever, you are my brother to me. Desperado, you weren't just some thug. You are one of the aces of the junior heavyweight division in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Kanemaru, 
whether you lined up next to us or supporting behind from behind, there is nobody more reliable, dependable than you are in the ring. Doiki, there's a lot of heel stick about dragging yourself up through the dirt floors, being out through hell. He lived it for real. That's strength. And Zach, you're not here today. But I'm glad that I went to England and brought you into Zuki Goon someday soon. Let's lock up, take an arm, take a leg, and beat the piss out of each other again. So again, why are you applauding? Since the group was born, you booed us, harassed us, called us shit, told us to die, sometimes throw trash at us. And now look. You really love us. So it's time to say it. In 2023, it's a new voyage for Suzuki Goon. Each member will be taking their own paths. At the end of this year, 2022, Suzuki Goon will be no more. So this was the shocking development. I mean, I start to grow into Suzuki Goon, you know, due to the fact that the way they are as as a team but also what they can do in the ring and many fans i've been watching on twitter are saying get ready for tai chi goon there are those that believe that tai chi can step up and reform the faction <coughs> what was based out of suzuki goon now we don't know yet what's going to happen all we can do is wait what's going to happen after 2023 so that is something we could see happen so i mean it's sad but some things are come to an end. But some of you may ask, why? Why would Suzuki Goon, uh, Minoru Suzuki make the decision to disband Suzuki Goon? There's an obvious reason for that. He felt for two reasons. One, what, what do they need them for? And two, much of 2022, he's been on excursion. You know, not only wrestling here in the States, but in England and other locations. So it would make sense why he would do it. So not going to hold him accountable for that. Now our next match we have um, <coughs> the Wild Hips consistent of Clark Connors and Ryusuke Taguchi teaming up with the Bebop tag team Yano and Tanahashi to take on members of the LIJ um, Tight Ditan, Bushi, Sonata, and Naito. So I thought this match was pretty fun. Not to mention when they try to toss um, <coughs> Sonata up to Taguchi's butt. But however, that backfired until he saw all four members. And he tried to play the role. Come on, guys. Let's fist bump. Nope. Not having it. But it was a pretty good match. Um, it was, of course, um, Destino that finished off. Uh, Connors giving the LIJ um, the win. But the obvious question does remain. Um... As you know, Naito, he will not be participating in Wrestle Kingdom like he would have hoped for. Let's just hope that he can participate in some way. Now, our next match, we have Tama Tonga, Master Wato, and um, uh, Kagushika Okada take on the members of the Bullet Club consistent of Ghetto, Taiji Shimuri, and J um, Jay White. As you know, we still see the, the issues between Jay White and Tama Tonga taking a toll not to mention we know that tai chi uh, uh, taiji shimuri and wada will be participating in that four-way match at russell kingdom but the one thing that was made clear is that somehow jay white is trying to pretend that everything is still under his control all this but it was of course when he used the blade runner not once but twice on both okada and um wato but he gave the credit to ghetto to pick up the win but it's a clear message to Okada telling him that he is going to walk out as the winner at Wrestle Kingdom 17. So the obvious question is how confident is Jay White? Remember, Jay White did lose to Okada once, and that was at the G1 Supercard. Now our next match is the championship match that we've been waiting for. We have Hikuleo taking on Carl Anderson. Now, I'm going to rearrange this one. No, guys. There is no partnership between both um, New Japan and 
WWE. This is only a mutual agreement that to allow Carl Anderson to participate. That's always been the key part, part um, mutual agreement. But however, this match was so interesting. However, Ghetto, once again, he gets involved in this particular match. But out of nowhere, we do, do see a, the gun stun on Hikuleo picking up the win. However, as soon as the post-match was happening, uh, Anderson goes out saying that he is the greatest never open weight champion. Here comes Tama Tonga. But if you guys remember months ago, Tama did want the never open weight title, but <coughs> he didn't have it for too long until he lost it to Carl Anderson. And of course, there was a brawl between the two. And then, of course, out of nowhere, the gun stun by Carl Anderson. Tama had him right in the gun stun, but no. Um, Carl Anderson actually pulled it off himself, but he declared Tama as his next uh, challenger at Wrestle Kingdom. So, and now it's been confirmed that match is going to happen as well. Now, this is match number one of our main of, double main event. We have the Super Junior Tag League final. We have the Bullet Club, um, Ace Austin and Chris Bay taking on. Um, Chaos is Leo Rush and Yo. I thought this match was insane. Now, keep in mind, Yo has already won the Super Junior Tag League three times, and all three times with with Show prior before he turned his back on him, siding with, of course, the House of Torture. But I have to say, they pulled off a pretty impressive match. We thought that the final hour could have de uh, defeated Bullet Club. We thought it was. Of course, the 3K, no. And then, of course, Bullet Club tried to pull off some tricks of their own. It did not work out, but it was Yo's direct drive onto Ace Austin that gave them the win. And, of course, Chaos won the match, becoming the next challengers for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team titles at Wrestle Kingdom against Cash 2-2. And, of course, on the record, this is now Yo's fourth jun Super Junior Tag League um win in his career like i said the first three times it was with of course show and now leo rush people viewed uh, yo and leo rush as the ultimate underdogs because the reason behind that they never worked together before they were two completely different from each other but they were able to find the rhythm to make it all the way to the finals and i think that tells us they were the ones from the bottom worked their way to the top now, our other second main event, of course, is the World Tag League Final. We have Bishimon, last year's winners, Yoshihashi and Hiroki Goto, taking on Ozzy Open, Kyle Fletcher, and Mark Davis. Now, keep in mind, many fans believed this is going to be Ozzy Open's night, but no, this match ended like was so intense. You can tell this is something <coughs> of the ages. Both teams who are determined... the go to Wrestle Kingdom, and that's always been the case. But, however, n uh, the Choto did not work out like they would have hoped, but they tried something else on Fletcher. I think they call it the Marukub. I don't know. If that was what it's called. But it did give a Bushimon the win, and, and this is the s second time Bushimon Wicks wins World Tag League. And, of course, on the record, um, this is... I believe Hiroki Goto, just like Sho, like Yo, this is his fourth World Tag League um, match, uh, World Tag League cha that he's ever won. The first one was with uh, Katsuyoro Shibata. Uh, second time, I think it was with, I forgot it was the second one that he won it with. But we know that last year and now this year is, of course. But interesting is Sho, uh, Yoshihashi called out Yo and and Leo Rush, because it became the night of chaos. Chaos took away, took both wins. And of course, we did not see the speech between both Leo and Yo, what they have to say. And I think they were grateful they became Leo and Yo partners. And Leo did mention that this was the greatest moment of his life, you know, of his career as a pro wrestler for almost nine years. And I think this is one of the best timings now that chaos won the night. So the obvious question now is, will both teams do the impossible? Will they win the their the respective tag team title matches? We just got to wait and see until January 4th. I'm excited. I hope you guys are excited too. So 
Let's just keep on rooting. And right now, let's move on with AEW Dynamites. Winter is coming. Okay, our last review, AEW Dynamite, Winter is Coming. Um, we had some great memories with Winter and Coming over time. Who could forget the Winter is Coming when Sting debuted and when Kenny defeated Moxley for the AEW World title. So what else can we expect for this year's Winter is Coming? Well, let's see. Uh, we opened up with, of course, <coughs> our, I think this is the fourth match. <coughs> yes, fourth match in the best of seven series. Now, keep in mind, this is a war between both the Elite and Death Triangle for the Trios Championship. So, right now, um, um, Death Triangle are in the lead. But last, two weeks ago, it was the Elite who picked up the win. Now, things got a little interesting. At some point during the match, uh, Nick Jackson hurt his ankle. He went, they took him to the backstage to take a look. But it became more of a handicap at some majority time of the match, but Nick made the drastic measure to come back to give a helping hand. But once again, like any other mem time when we see uh, Death Triangle, they use the hammer on Nick to pick up the win. So another disappointing loss. So Death Triangle are currently in the lead with three um, with three wins and the Elite only once. But however, during the post-match, Nick ja I mean, uh, Kenny Omega in the post-match said, how about let's make our next match into a no disqualification? Basically, they decided to play the game of Death Triangle since they like to cheat. That's the that's what they're going to go with. And of course, Pac is excited for that. But you know how Phoenix is. He's conflicted about using weapons. But we'll see what happens then. Now, Alex Marvez does an interview with MJF. MJF, uh, as you know, tr spreading his reign of terror as the AEW World Champion. Never sees to amaze me. <coughs> but he applauds Ricky Starks making it this far. But he feels that his story about him, uh, you know, his lifestyle, living in his own car. He says no one cares that he's the one who's been living the life, you know, with everything that was given to him and all this. So that's the kind of thing MJF is. Sprit, proving that he is better than everyone else. Now, we do see the acclaim come out, do the thing, but they were viciously attacked by Jay Lethal, Satnam Singh, Jeff Jarrett, and the Sanjay Dutt. Now, it appears that they're, dec they're asking for a chance for the AEW World Tag Team Titles. Now, keep in mind, if you guys remember completely, um, of course, a um, they called out the second best tag team in AEW, and of course that was FTR. But they tried the other teams like the Gun Club and Lethal, Lethal and Jared tried to weasel their way in. But um, the real question is, will the acclaim accept it? We'll just wait and see when it happens after this brutal beatdown. Now our next interview this time with Sh Tony Schiavone, we had the Jericho Appreciation Society. Now we all know what happened at Ring of Honor. Jericho he always complains and moans about stuff that is barbaric, and he claims that swing that he get Claudio put him through should be banned, and all this. But of course, uh, Daniel Garcia, who lost the Pure Championship, Jericho posted himself saying that he's going to that he's a re needs a real mentorship, so he assigns Sammy Guevara. But you can tell that Daniel Garcia is not happy about it. So we'll see what happens then. Now, our next match, we have Brian Cage along with Prince Nana taking on Jungle Boy. This is like a true David versus Goliath. And I feel like this is the a match where you probably would have assumed Brian Cage would have walked out as the winner. But no, it was, of course, Jungle Boy who walked out, who made the biggest upset taking on a bigger individual. But however, in the post-match, he was not too happy after what happened on... Um, last week where he was eliminated eliminated from the diamond ring battle royal thanks to big bill morrissey he calls him out and as soon as he comes out he, well we had stokey hideaway all this other stuff and it was an ambush on their part to attack jungle boy but however 
we saw a surprising appearance and to save Jungle Boy. And now was Hook. Now keep in mind, Stokey Hathaway went out to spread a conspiracy saying that there was an illegal move by the ref that caused Lee Moriarty to win. We all know that's not happened. Even Taz said it himself. He looked in the video. There was nothing illegal wrong with the match, how it ended. So right now it looks more like Hook has picked up a new friend along the way. So basically, you're going to need people who have a common enemy. And that's going to be Hook and Jungle Boy. So what do you call this? I say people, I should they should call it Jungle Hook. Think about it. Think about it. Now, we do see a backstage presence from the Bull, uh, Blackpool Combat Club giving the entire locker room notice, telling them if you guys are looking for a fight, if you guys want the Ring of Honor <coughs> World Championship or the PR Championship, you know where to find us. But also, John Moxley sent out a message to, of course, Hammond at a page telling him, bring your Dark Order buddies. Now, at the result of what happened at Final Battle this past weekend, what does this mean, the relationship between both Lee and Strickland? Well, Lee just made it clear that they are no longer friends. But we could see a rivalry between the two. So we'll move on to that. Now our next, but this was an interesting matchup. We have the House of Black. Malachi, Buddy, and Brody, along with Julia, taking on the Factory. QT, Cole Carter, and Aaron Solo, alongside Nick Camarado and um, <coughs> Lee Johnson. But before the bell rings, Nick Camarado got in the face of, of course, the House of Black. But Julia comes out. She spits the black mist onto Camarado. While Brody... And Buddy were cleaning that crap out of the the factory. This is what was going on in the ring. Malachi Black was just there sitting. QT is in the ring watching the factory getting decimated. No one was doing the thing. So the obvious question was, yes, it appears that House of Black has declared war against everyone. Now when the bell rings... This is one of the things that could have happened for QT. One, he could have run like hell, saved himself, but nope, he tried to grow some balls. He got black masked. It was over. Just like that. But what does this mean for the factory? I mean, how much beating can they take from the House of Black? If I knew that question, I would know, but no. We just got to wait and see what happens then. So very surprising how that's going to end. Now, our next interview we have from Renee's with Britt and with, uh, Britt Baker along with Rebel. Now, you know how Britt Baker is stingy with Renee being friends with Soraya. Um, you know, claiming once again that Jamie Hayter is going to win. No one's unbeatable. But however, Sky Blue decided to come out and decide she's going to have a fight against Britt Baker. And of course, Britt saying that no one's going to beat her and Jamie. There is a moment, I do believe, in this storyline where, of course, Jamie Hayter is going to realize that Britt is only using her because of her status as a champion. And I think this is where, of course, Tony Storm is going to tell her, that's what's going to, that's what I've been trying to tell you. But sooner or later, we're going to see that. Now, our next match. Now, Jericho, as you know, is not a happy camper after losing his match against Claudio Castanelli. He had a match against a jobber. Or as we call it in AW, an enhancement name, Action Andretti. This is one of the most exciting matches. We all know all the moves that Jericho does. When he applied the code breaker, Action Andretti kicked out of it. Jericho was in shock. And the match went on and on, all this and that. But I think the biggest upset is when And. Und Action Andretti pulled off the biggest win ever. He applied a shooting star press, <coughs> beating Jericho, and of course getting the biggest crowd reaction ever. 
As soon as after this match happened, it was announced that he is now all elite. So, like, wow, that's interesting to see. But as for Jericho, he is not happy. Now, he was treating this match as a tune-up in hopes that he could get a rematch against Claudio to reclaim the Ring of Honor World Championship. But what does this mean for Jericho? How would this affect him for a chance for a rematch? That's the key thing right there with Jericho. Basically, he's going to hold this loss as a the biggest disappointing loss in his career. People call this, uh, I think Excalibur called this match upset of the decade. And possibly you can agree upon that. Now, our, um, our next segment, as you know, we have Ricky Starks talking about MJF. Telling him that this is his time, that he's going to win this one completely. And I'm sure many of us are rooting for, of course, um, Ricky that picked up the win. Now, for the last couple of weeks or months, FTR has been under the skin of we're ignoring the ass boys the entire time. As you know, the ass boys were sick and tired of FTR being declared the best tag team, that their legacy was being flourished. They felt it's their God-given destiny to destroy that legacy. But now that FTR are acknowledging them, they're saying that they'll beat the crap out of them. You know, that's how it is. So we're looking forward to that match when it takes place. Now, our next match, we have Ty Mello versus Ruby Soho. Now, they haven't seen each other since the all-out buy-in where um, Ruby broke her nose. You know for a fact in this match that Ty is going to be targeting the nose of Ruby. That's always been the clear case right there. But you can tell there was a lot of frustrations with Ruby when it comes to Ty Mello. But luckily, it was the destination unknown that sealed the deal for her. But however, someone did not take this too kindly with Ty Mello losing, and that is Anna J. So if I was Ruby, I would bring in a friend for help. So who would that will be? Well, we'll just wait and see what happens then. Now, Alex Marvez does his interview with Hangman Adam Page talking about Moxley calling him out. Evil Uno was right there with him. Concern over Hangman Page, as you know, we are not sure if he's 100% cleared after having that big concussion thanks to Moxley. He does remember everything, but the one thing that kind of he mentioned that he forgot was the name of his son. And of course, he is looking <coughs> for a fight against him, so we'll be seeing that soon enough. Now, our next little segment we have is, of course, Dustin Rhodes teaming up with the best friends Chuck and Trent, along also with OC, and, of course, Dan Housen was along, calling out um, Kip Sabian, Trent Seven, and the Butcher and the Blade, and they're saying that they, they clear, um, issued a challenge to them for this Friday's Rampage. So this is going to be interesting to see. Now, our next match is a winner-takes-all match. This is for both the Diamond uh, Dynamite Diamond Ring and the AEW um, World Championship. Ricky Starks versus MJF. I have to say, it was a pretty good match. It was very interesting. You probably would have presumed this one was going to go with MJF in some ways because there was no way MJF was going to stick with this belt for a short time. But we all know how the, how MJF claims that he's better than everybody. Without the referee noticing, he kicked him in the groin and, of course, retained the towel. Now, as soon as MJF was leaving, here comes the dra American Dragon, Brian Danielson, who hasn't forgotten what he did to Regal. He chases him down. And, of course, when he got up, he actually p uh, picked up Ricky Starks uh, to see if he was okay. But the obvious question now is, Will Daniel Gar uh, da Brian Danielson will be the next person to challenge MJF for the AEW World Championship. We know he wants uh, to become a champion as well, so we just got to wait and see when that day comes. Um, but we will see what happens on Rampage this Friday. I think that's pretty much it right now with AEW. So let's move on to our final thing before we end this episode, news updates. Okay. Well,
welcome to our news update. So, this is what we have. Now, we're still continuing on with more on Mandy Rose. As you guys saw the news update alert I posted. Yes, she was released due to the explicit content. Uh, I feel like there, that there was more to this that we don't know. But, um, according to what sources are saying... Apparently, they're saying that she was warned not to do this. I don't I don't know if that was true or not. We know that there have been some wrestlers that were do, did some things. I mean, who could forget about Paige, also known as uh, now as Soraya, uh, what happened with her a couple years ago and all that stuff. And, of course, um, that's the thing. So they made the decision to release her due to that. But they did state that she could return um, to WWE when she's no longer doing that store, sort of uh, exclusive content. That's what she was. They're saying. So we'll just help. We we'll just see what happens then. I know that there are many people who are gonna ha have speculations what she's gonna do next. But however, um, I did saw this tweet. Um, wrestler, if you guys know her, um, Alex Gracia. Uh, they posted a tweet calling her out saying, let's team up. Hmm, that could be interesting. But we just, we'll wait and see. Now for our GCW updates here, we have, of course, some matches that have been announced. Uh, for, well, the ones we already know, like 56 nights that will take place on January 1st of 2023. Uh, we're going to have Masha Slamovich and Ra uh, Cole Radderick. Originally, this was supposed to be at Till Infinity, but apparently they decided to move it to the following day. Uh, for the Don't Talk to Me on the 20th, it was announced that we're going to have uh, Car um, Ricky Morton, rock and roll legend, taking on Tony Depp. And this is going to be another interesting matchup to watch. Now, uh, Wrestling Revolver has announced for two wrestlers that will be participating on the on the 2nd of February of 2023, a night of the Moxbury. We have Zachary Wentz and Speedball Mike Bailey. Now, we don't know yet what's the matches that will be taking place on that particular day. But if there's new wrestlers that will be making their way there, I'll be announcing those too. Now, uh, new information has arised from Pro Wrestling Gorilla regarding um, the Battle of Los Angeles. Uh, it appears that Mike Bailey, who was um, booked for night one, uh, he's unable to participate for night one, but he said he could participate in night two. Um, apparently, they decided to add another wrestler so they can face Mike Bailey in um, for night uh, for the round one matches in night, and they picked SB Kento, who will be there. So it's kind of interesting how things have changed. I know that Mike Bailey is. Been the pun. I wouldn't be surprised if he was double booked or whatever. Now, for our upcoming event at the Prestige Wrestling for Reality Unfold that will take place on the 17th of February, we have Masha Slamich making her return. That's going to be awesome. Uh, we're going to have a death match taking place between Drelks and Akira, the Death Samurai. Then we have a match between Jaden versus Alan Angels. Now, I did mention um, Alex Shelley will be there to defend his title, but it's still to be determined for his opponent. So we will wait and see who he'll be facing for his title. Now, uh, more entrants are coming up for the Jersey Championship Wrestling Battle Bowl that will, Battle Bowl that will take place on the 1st of January on 2023. Uh, they announced Axton Ray is the next entrant, so that's going to be killer. Now, um, we do have a match that was set up for later on this month for House of Glory Revelations. The crown jewel will be defended. Charles Mason puts his title on the line. That sadistic bastard will face Lance Dorado. It doesn't surprise me that he will try to take off his mask. Now, um, I found something interesting for everybody. If you guys are Mina Shirakawa fans out there, um, monthly... Kuro Risu uh, wrote an article about Mina Shirakawa about uh, things that were interesting about her from what they're talking. They're saying some people think that, you know, she did not fit the criteria 
due to the fact that she was older. Uh, she was, you know, I think she was 32 when she first joined Stardom. Uh, she was only like only 30 when she began wrestling. They felt that Stardom should have focused on um, the younger generation girls, but they were impressed how Mina has evolved, and I know I have been impressed. Some of you have been impressed. So you can look it up. Um, it's from Monthly Pure Risu. Uh, you can check that out. Um, now, finally, this one's a very interesting one on Busted Open Radio. Uh, Mickey James talked about Roxanne Perez. Now, if you guys remember clearly when um, Roxanne Perez made, before she went to WWE, um, she was in Impact Wrestling. But off camera on stage, Mickey James told her, don't ever come back to Impact. But it wasn't more like, you know, threatening her or anything. It was more like concern over her being there. But, however, she did state that she has a WWE tryout. So, basically, she was looking out for her. And I think I give Mickey James credit for that. And, of course, um, seeing her now, Roxanne, where she is now with in, in WWE as currently our new NXT Women's uh, Champion. I have to say there's, <coughs> I think, Mickey James, I'm not saying she's taking credit for this. But I felt maybe for her, I think her looking out for Roxanne might have helped her where she is now. Keep in mind, Roxanne's dreams was to be Women's Champion in WWE. And I think that's something that could be said about her. So, um I'm sure you can find it on a podcast, on the busted radio, what, whatever. But it's kind of interesting stuff to hear about. And even, of course, um, uh, Tommy Dreamer even talked about that, too, with Mickey James and Dexter. Um, I think that's pretty much it what we can talk about. So I think that's it for now. So let's just call it a day. Well, I hope everybody enjoys this episode coming up. Uh, we do have Impact Wrestling and MLW. If there's any other wrestling shows that I'm really um, looking forward to it, uh, I will do that. Uh, also, um, I forgot to do my podcast, so I will do it soon enough um, the, because I was mostly focused on this episode for all of you. So I think that's pretty much it. But anything goes, I'll let you I'll, let you guys know what I'm going to do when I post it out. So I think that's pretty much it. So I will see you guys on the next DWZ time. Same DWZ channel. I must bid all of you adieu. So, goodbye. And have a nice day.